Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. It's an absolute pleasure to have everyone together this morning for the next hour. Um, my name is David Hall. Uh, I'm founder of an organization called the Idea Center, which was set up about five years ago. Uh, and what we want to do this morning in this particular webinar is take you through um, a whole range of thinking, introduce some background theory that will hopefully provide you with an absolutely systematic approach to driving the creative process that then acts as the engine behind innovation. So that's where we're going to go with this. That's kind of the overview. Um, in terms of structure, uh, we are going to start off with some background. Let me give you the background and explain what it brings us all here today. Um, I started out, I, I tripped over a whole range of materials about 25 years ago. Uh, when I was a manufacturing director for an organization in the oil and gas sector. Uh, what we did as an organization was we built safety systems for oil and gas platforms. These were big, very complicated systems. Um, as manufacturing director, I was responsible for about 200 safety engineers on the shop floor. Um, what we did was um, put systems in place that would automatically shut down petrochemical installations in a crisis situation. So when anything goes wrong, what you want to do in a petrochemical installation is take the human out of it and automatically shut down the system in a very safe manner. Um, every system was a one-off. Everything was heavily customized. Um, typical man hours in an assembly of one of these units was anywhere between 60 and 80,000 man hours to give you an indication of size. Testing was between 20 and 30,000 man hours. My job as the manufacturing director, as far as I could see, was to tip up for board meetings every month and get beaten up, quite frankly, because invariably when I picked up the role, we would overrun every project by a minimum of 25% on hours, an absolute minimum. And therefore, if anything ever went wrong in design, we'd find it on the shop floor, we'd overrun our budgets, and I'd get beaten up at the board meeting. It was a standard ritual that had gone on for years, I understand. Um, at the time, I was doing some uh, training, material management training, and I picked up a course on manufacturing management, which felt only right and proper. And at the same time, someone had recommended to me that there was a soft option you could do around the edges that gave you the CPD points and all those good things based around creative management. A whole bunch of weird stuff happened in it, but it didn't really matter because you could just put it down and never touch it again at the end of the course, but you got the credits in the bank. So what's not to like, for goodness sake? So on the back of that, I did these two courses in parallel. The manufacturing course was as dull as dishwater. Um, the creative management course, however, was phenomenal in introducing new ways of thinking. And at one point I was uh, due to do an assignment and therefore I grabbed a few of my direct reports together um, and asked them to beg me, I beg a favor. I said, basically, look, can I run a creative session with you on a real manufacturing issue that we've got? Um, no more than an hour. You need never worry about it again. I'll write it up at the end as an experience and there's my assignment done. I get credits and all those good things. So again, all very good indeed. Um, we held the session late on a Friday afternoon when everyone else had gone home and about halfway through, jaw-dropping stuff started to happen. What we recognized was all of a sudden we were starting to challenge conventional and traditional thinking. Things that had locked us into a particular way of operation for years, all of a sudden we were taking a fresh approach around. On the back of that, not only did I write up the assignment to get a reasonable mark, we started running the sessions on a weekly basis every Friday afternoon. And within two years, we moved from a position of consistently overrunning budgets by a minimum of 25% to routinely undercutting budgets on exactly the same calculator by a minimum of 15%. Now, that's extraordinary stuff. Um, we eventually spread it across the entire organization through engineering and operations, all disciplines. And on the back of that, why wouldn't you take those techniques wherever you went in life? So I moved on from there into contract electronics. Uh, I was chief executive for an organization that built printed circuit boards for other people. We didn't do the design work. But what we did do was stuff the printed circuit boards and then ship them off to the end client. So Acorn PCs, for example, we used to make all the Acorn PCs in the UK. We used to make the BBC Micros before that. A lot of medical devices, anything that goes ping in a hospital, we probably manufactured that at some point. Um, we took the creative techniques into there and we started offering them to clients. We differentiated ourselves on the back of the skills we had for driving creative thinking inside the organization and actually then offering them as a service, no charge to clients, on the back of the fact it massively differentiated us. None of our competitors were doing any of this, um, doing any of this work. Then I went into 2001, I became chief exec of the Horse Racing Forensic Laboratory, which is basically the organization in the UK that does all the drug testing for British horse racing. Curious organization, I joined it in 2001. The organization was 38 years old when I joined it. Um, 
it had lost money. It sat in the public sector. It was owned by uh, British Horse Racing, but actually uh, was run by a government quango, actually owned by a government quango, uh, which is fair to the banker for horse racing. And uh, the history of the organization for 38 years sat in the uh, public sector. It had lost money every single month, operated a deficit every single month for 38 years. Curious organization, the closest thing I've ever come across to a country club culture. It was a, a group of scientists that would tip up for work every day and do an interesting day's science. Uh, no commercial pressures whatsoever. If ever it did make a loss, all it had to do was to invoice the parent for that loss at the end of the month and hey presto, it broke even. There were no commercial pressures on the organization whatsoever. Um, people would tip up for work, do an interesting day's science, go home, repeat 365 days a year. My brief as only the fourth ever chief exec of the organization was to turn it round, move it from deficit into surplus. And we did it in less than six months. Now you can't change the culture in less than six months, but you can change the climate. And what we did, I promise you, all we had to do was change the way people thought about what they did. We paid our first staff bonus at the end of the first year, and every year thereafter, we paid increasing bonus levels. We never missed a year. We became embarrassingly profitable, sat in the public sector, doing a whole range of commercial activity on top of the horse racing, um, and therefore, we privatized in 2007 and privatized or sold again, sorry, in 2010. And it was on the back of that, having narrowly missed the management buyout opportunity, that I decided to blazes with this. If ever I'm going to do my own thing, now's the time to do it. And clearly, with 20 years of experience in creativity and innovation, step change behind me, it became obvious that that was the focus. And so that's what the Idea Center is all about. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, what I want to do is, to, is show you the thinking that we've developed and the systematic approaches to driving uh, step change, creative thinking that, that fuels the innovation process. And it's entirely experientially based. Uh, the headline for this stuff is, this stuff works. This has been applied in a range of different organizations, different sizes, different sectors. This stuff works anywhere where an organization is trapped by conventional and traditional thinking and knows it and then wants to break free. I'm sick and tired of telling people to think differently. What we can do is provide you with mechanisms for achieving it. So that's where we're gonna go. Um, none of the stuff is gonna be rocket science. You're gonna look at a lot of this stuff and think, well, I kinda of knew this stuff already, and that's fine. Uh, the way I piece it together, however, and the story I lay out in front of you, will hopefully reveal some penny dropping moments that starts to explain some stuff that previously you may have missed. So let's start here. Change over time. I've worked in lots of organizations, had leadership positions in, in many different organizations in different sectors. And if you look at change over time, I don't care. Any organization of any type in any sector experiences a, a phenomenal rate of change around it. Um, and the rate of change fuels the rate of change. What you have is this exponential explosion of stuff happening around us. Um, and this could almost be any parameter. If you look at the economy and look at the rate of change of the economy over time, um, you can see the transformation that's taking place. Politics, for goodness sake. Look at UK politics. Um, it's, we've got to the stage now, such as, and it's kind of fueled by communication technology, I guess. But you've got a position now where a budget can be issued on the Thursday of one week. Um, such as the furore of social media that then builds up. You get ministerial resignations over the weekend. And the budget is reissued on Tuesday of the following week. That is a phenomenal rate of change. You consider, with what, consider that or compare that with what would have happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. That would have taken months and months to process as it unrolled, unraveled in front of you. And for goodness sake, this is Moore's law for anyone who's close to technology. Just consider the technology around your ears today. Then go back three years. Then go back another three. You don't have to go back far. You're in the technological dark ages. Uh, when I left manufacturing, I left manufacturing in 1998, which for goodness sake is yesterday in the grand scheme of things. Uh, the last big decision we made, we just built a new factory in Essex, uh, staff, uh, housing 260 staff, world-class, state-of-the-art, surface mount technology throughout, just fantastic facility. And the last business decision we had to make as an organization was to decide how many internet connections to go into that factory. And it was a very brief meeting because we quite rapidly concluded that no organization in their right mind, this is 1998, would put more than one internet connection into a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility. That's 1998, that's yesterday, for goodness sake, in the grand scheme of things. And sure enough, that's what we did. We had an open plan shop floor, lots of surface mount technology. We had a mezzanine floor above it, which were all the open plan offices. There was a single desk that had a computer on it that was the computer you had to go to if you wanted to send an email. 
or for goodness sake, if you wanted to go on the internet, but no one really knew why you might want to go on the internet. Um, so it was a curious situation. That's relatively yesterday, and look where we are today. And this is brilliant news, because if you're entrepreneurial, if you're creative, if you're innovative, what it means is we have an exploding universe of opportunity out there, or a world of what might be. Just fantastic opportunity. All we have to do is find mechanisms of tapping into that activity, find out, pick and choose. You have to assume somewhere in the world today there is something happen that, happening that could revolutionize the way you operate inside your organization. All we have to do is access it. So this is brilliant news, good news. However, and it's a big however, we as individuals and collectively as cultures, we can't keep up with this rate of change. This rate of change is too damn fast for us. We don't have the mental capacity to handle it. And kind of more fundamentally, we have a particular characteristic as a human. We make sense of our worlds by looking backwards. If ever we're going to decide what to do next or how to solve a problem, what we will first do is look backwards. We look at past experience, we look at knowledge, we look at training, we look at understanding, stuff we've developed in the past. And we apply that today to then determine how we're going to operate in the future. So we take that backward looking perspective and then decide today how to apply it to affect our behaviors in the future. Now we're good. If you take a group of people, we're good networkers. We can work with each other. And if you have a group of people in a room, every one of them has a different past. So every one of them has a different contribution to make. And we can learn off each other. So we say, well, hang on, if we pull all this together, we can do a lot better. We can improve over time, but we improve at a much, much slower rate. Because fundamentally, at any moment in time, if we're gonna make a decision about the future, the first thing we do is look backwards. And based on that backward looking perspective, we then decide and determine how we're gonna behave moving forward. And it fundamentally, traps us therefore because of this backward looking inertia traps us traps us in this world of what is and this is a beautifully well behaved world because there are no shocks and surprises in this world because everything is broadly consistent with what's happened before and we sit in this world beautifully enclosed in an ever evolving gently improving environment surrounded by an atmosphere that locks us in there which is effectively conventional and traditional thinking so we're locked in this world of what is by an atmosphere of conventional and traditional thinking. Now, every decision we make in an organization, therefore, is taken through the prism of our world, our world of what is, and every organization has that collective uh, world of what is. And organizations miss enormous opportunities on the back of it. Probably the best classic example of this will be Kodak. Uh, Kodak, when I was young, in kind of the 1970s and my teenage years, um, I was brought up in Hamel Hempstead, and, and centre of Hamel Hempstead, uh, just north of London, what we have is a major uh, administrative uh, building, multi-storey facility, which was one of the European headquarters for Kodak. Kodak at the time were the preeminent uh, player within the photography industry. They, they dominated the world, a little gold box of film with a little red lettering, what's not to like. They had a brilliant business model. Uh, which was to have low-cost cameras. They were founded in 1888, for goodness sake. They've been doing this for a long time. They produced low-cost cameras, uh, but made their money on consumables. They made their money out of film-based technology. So they had high-margin film, but low-cost cameras. Brilliant model. Worked phenomenally well. They dominated the world in that environment. They also invented digital photography. They invented digital photography. Imagine what happened. Chief engineer tips up at a board table and says, Yo, for goodness sake, you never guess what I've done. I've tested it in the marketplace. Folks love this stuff. Um, I dumped a, a camera on the table for people to pass around and have a look. And, and, and the board members are marveling at it. We're going, cracky, this is fantastic. Look at the fine engineering here. Then someone must have asked the killer question, where's the film? And once they picked themselves up off the floor through laughter, the first decision they took was to can all research and development spend on the digital camera followed by canning all the marketing activity on the same. Because their view was, why would an organization that had made all its success on the back of film-based technology introduce a camera that had no film? It was suicidal. So what they did was systematic, that they strategically decided to walk away from it. Competition, marketplace, loved it. And the reason they loved it was because it had no film, for goodness sake. So what happened was competition in the marketplace took off towards this world of what might be creating a new future. And Kodak stayed in their cozy little film-based world. Now, you don't die immediately when you make those kind of decisions as an organization, but you bleed to death slowly. 
And in the very same month that Kodak filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the States, the same month, two weeks later, Instagram sold to Facebook for over a billion dollars. That is the opportunity Kodak missed when they made their decision, their strategic decision, based on their strategic world of what is. Now, gross example, I'll grant you. However, you've got to assume in every organization, similar decisions being made and opportunities being missed. What we want to do, what we'd love to do, is make a transformation. We'd like to break free from this world of what is and access some of this what might be. And the snag is, I mean, it all neat to do, but the snag is that we've got some mental blocks in the way. We've got things that happen inside our heads that make it impossible to make that transformation. And these mental blocks are effectively hardwired within our DNA. Um, it's fight or flight stuff. We learned it uh, many, many years ago in the development cycle of the human race. We learned not to do anything rash and outrageous because you can die for goodness sake. Now, things have moved on. You don't lose your life quite so easily. However, we have deeply ingrained within our DNA a fear of the unknown, and therefore we play safe. And you can never make these blocks go away. But if you understand the blocks exist, you can choose to use techniques that will allow you to overcome them. And what we're going to be talking about today in the next 40 minutes is understanding those blocks and then understanding how the techniques work to overcome those blocks because you can never make them go away. The techniques are quite unusual and unfamiliar for many. Um, the majority of in people in organizations are familiar with continuous improvement. And this stuff is quite different from continuous improvement. Continuous improvement I was kind of born out of the um, 70s and 80s, I guess, um, based out of the Japanese approach to transform, transforming their quality issues. And the basic premise was you ask everyone in the organization um, to look at what they do, treat them as an expert in what they do, and see if they can't identify ways of doing things better. And it doesn't matter how small the incremental change. If you make enough of these incremental changes over time, it builds up into quite a sizable change. And it can transform an organization. Uh, it was termed uh, continuous improvement, Kaizen, uh, lean, Six Sigma, total quality, total quality management all have the same underlying philosophy. And it's all based on doing things better. And it's all based on bottom-up processes. You get everyone involved. This is a cultural transformation that we're looking to make. Hugely effective. Um, but it's got a limit. And the limit is it's to do with doing things better. And better is a relative word. Better is all about taking the world of what is and seeing if you can't improve it. See if you can't make it a better version of what it used to be. It's an evolutionary incremental process. And we can get improvements, but we can never get above the mental blocks. Because to do that, what we need is step change. We need changes that go way beyond the evolutionary step, that overcome those mental blocks, that release the potential that is otherwise trapped in the organization. And this stuff is not about doing things better. This will reveal ways of doing things differently. And I mean fundamentally challenge the business model, the world of what is, you will question because you're breaking free from convention and tradition. And because of that, you have to have a degree of leadership support in order to drive those changes. And these step changes, these discontinuous steps, are a, have got to be driven, I've actually written bottom up, it should be driven top down. This has to be a top down, not a bottom up process because you need the leadership skills to overcome the innate barriers to that transformation process. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about, and that's where we're gonna go. So, bear with me, these are gonna be unusual techniques, uh, the likes of which you, the majority of you won't be familiar with, I feel certain, if anyone. Simple structure, uh, we're gonna talk about the blockages to creativity, we have to understand those before we can start to understand how to overcome them. Uh, we're going to talk about the techniques as well, clearly. However, there's, there's a gap in the middle there, and there's a gap for a very specific reason. There's some connective tissue missing here that is essential for us to understand how these blockages can be overcome and how the techniques will work. And it's all based on the fact that if you look at it, children are fantastic at this creative piece. Children are innately creative in the way they think, the way they operate. They are just fantastically creative individuals. But as they grow up, they lose the creativity. And by the time you reach adulthood, you've lost the ability to drive the creative process. And what we have to do is understand how children think. And many people confuse this. They see me then talking about childish behavior. And it's not childish, it is childlike behavior. We have to understand how children think to be able to learn from that and then apply it. Then we can understand how these techniques work. So the, the missing word in that agenda there is playfulness. And we'll just touch upon playfulness to make sure we understand it. But it will be riddled through the session that we're, we're about to undertake. So now let's go from here.
Now, two key words we also need to look at. Um, we in the Idea Centre talk to a lot of organisations about this whole change process and people get very excited and two words in particular pop up on a regular basis. One of those is innovation. Um, very powerful word. I, I don't think now, I, I don't think there's an organisation in the land that does not claim to be innovative. Every organisation claims to be innovative for goodness sake. Now, they normally say, yeah, yeah, we're definitely an innovative organisation. It's in our mission statement. That proves clearly they're an innovative company. Or they'll say, yes, 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 we've got that. But one of our values is to be innovative. That sounds great. Um, I was talking to a manufacturing organisation in the Manchester area and they said, yep, yep, but we're definitely innovative. Every single member of staff in the entire organisation has as a personal objective to be innovative it's a clearly innovative organization the interesting thing then is if you ask any of those organizations what they mean by the word ask them to define the word innovation and my experience I am yet to find any organization that can give you a consistent concise definition of the word innovation they all talk about in the babble senselessly and after a 15 minute period will give you a definition the muscle the one up from somewhere um, it'll be very ad hoc and abstract and probably inaccurate, but nevertheless, they'll do it. I was uh, running a two-day uh, conference, innovation conference, for a large transport company, two billion euro company based in Europe uh, with operations throughout Europe. And it was in the UK, a two-day conference, and I asked them what they meant by the word innovation, kind of core, if we're doing a conference on it. Fifteen minutes later, they conceded they had no definition. Creativity, similar. Everyone knows they need to be creative. It's increasingly the flavor of the day. They use the word, but they have no understanding of what the meaning of it is. They're slightly unnerved by it, actually, because it tends to be pink and fluffy, kind of challenging, a bit weird around the edges. Um, creative types are difficult to manage, unpredictable off the wall. Um, creative types, if they're sat in front of a client, you want to make sure there's someone sane sat next to them, undoing whatever damage they're doing, but ideally before they've done it, before it goes too far for certain. You might want a few people who are creative. Most organizations will say, no, 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 you're safe with us. We're innovative. Uh, we've got a, some people in marketing who are a bit creative. Or we have an agency that does the creative thing for us. So we say, we're okay. And, and the problem is the baggage that comes with the word. No one has an understanding of it. And I want to give you a very simple definition of both these words. Um, first definition is that of creativity. Creativity is simply the process of generating ideas that are both novel and useful. So it's generating ideas that are both novel and useful. And you need the combination of the two. We are all innately good at generating useful ideas. It's what adults are very, very good at. We are exceptionally good at generating useful ideas, but not novel. And generating and implementing useful ideas is great and drives the continuous improvement process. And arguably, um, you need useful ideas day by day, minute by minute. You need everyone in the organization to have the ability to generate useful ideas. And fortunately, we're good at it. We're educated to do it. But that is not a creative idea unless it's combined with novelty. It is equally not creative to generate a novel idea that is useless. If you've got novelty but no useful, you're nowhere. What you want is a crazy bonkers idea. And what I need to persuade you in the next half hour is that that is the essential first step of creativity. Every creative problem solving technique is a two stage process effectively. And the first stage is to forget useful. Useful kills novel, and I'll explain why later. But useful kills novel. Um, what we need to, therefore is to park useful. Useful is consistent with that world of what is, the world in which we're trapped, but it is not consistent with that outer, outer reaches of opportunity in that exploding universe. What we need to do is forget useful, generate a novel idea that could be crackers, bonkers, outrageous, out of this world, literally, um, that would solve the problem if only it were possible. Stage one of creativity. Stage two, grab hold of the novelty, don't let it go. Understand it, why does it work? And then once you've got that, do what we're good at as a human race and work out how to generate a useful approach to delivering the same effect. Two stage process. Stage one is called a, an intermediate impossible. It's a novel idea that would definitely solve the problem, if only it were possible, but it's not. Second stage, understand that novelty, grab hold of it, don't let it go, and then reverse useful into it. It is almost impossible to do it the other way around. Once you've got a useful idea, you are trapped in your world of what is. You will then repel anything that is not consistent with that world of what is. It's kind of physiological response. You will not do it. You will reject it. And therefore, we need to do it the other way around, which kind of feels strange. And that strangeness is essential to driving the creative process. So a nice simple definition. Penny dropping moment for me when I first came across this. Clearly, what you don't want is one or two people who can do this. This is a cultural 
thing. This is a cultural thing. When I joined the forensic science lab, the horse racing lab, um, we had a uh, hundred forensic scientists in the laboratory. If you'd asked how many creative forensic scientists would you want, most people would say, well, for goodness sake, we just need people who can follow a process. We had two and a half thousand standard operating procedures. Just do as you're told, follow the process. However, I was chief exec. Um, I, we'd been losing money for 38 years. If I asked the question, how many of my staff would I want to be able to generate ideas that are both novel and useful? Cricket, why wouldn't you want everyone to be able to do that? Which is effectively what we did. This is a culture change process because you want everyone to get the hang of this stuff. The sister definition for innovation is equally simple. It's simply the process of making money or adding value out of the implementation of novel and useful ideas. It's taking the creative output and then implementing it to make money or add value in the organization. And don't worry whether it's private sector, public sector. Making money tends to freak some people out in the public sector. Rest easy. This is about making your money go further, getting more money, or doing the same with a fraction of the money that you previously had. This is step function change in the finances of the organization. Two simple definitions. Who wouldn't want this stuff embedded in their organization? But it's difficult. And if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And it is difficult, but we are gonna show you a systematic way of approaching the creative process that will then drive innovation. So here we go. First, we need to understand the blockages. There are two blockages that we need to understand. Now, these blockages operate in every single one of us. You cannot make these blockages go away, but if you know they're there, you can choose to use techniques that will allow you to overcome them. And the easiest thing to do, they're all to do with what happens inside the brain, thinking process and patterning, and the easiest way to handle this is to take each one in turn, so here goes. First one of them is the thinking process. Um, and if you take everything that's ever been written about the thinking process, all the research that's been done over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, there's been a lot of the work. If you stand far enough back and squint your eyes, it kind of breaks into two categories, referred to as first stage thinking and second stage thinking. And the blockage that we all suffer from is that we are all massively conditioned to this thing called second stage thinking. Um, so such a, we're educated as second stage thinkers. We are exceptional second stage thinkers. Uh, to such an extent that the first stage thinking effectively withers on the vine and we don't do it. We neglect it massively. Very, very rarely do we introduce first stage thinking. We, we focus wholesale on second stage thinking. We're educated to do it. And second stage thinking is basically the process of taking information, processing that information, and then generating an outcome. It's as simple as that. It's taking information, it's processing the information, it's generating an outcome. Um, so um, you imagine uh, you step out of this webinar at some point, you have a conversation, I'm, bumping, I, I, I'm not quite sure what you believe the last hour, but my goodness, we've got a problem. I need to share a problem with you. And, and you cock an ear because you're interested. Um, and, and what they do is they start giving the information associated with that problem. And as soon as they give you information relating to the problem, you start processing it. And the more information you're given, the more processing you do. Uh, and anyway, more information, you ask for more information, more processing. And then when they dry up, what you say, because you're good, is you say, well, this is what we need to do. You've taken the information, you've processed it, you've generated an outcome, three-stage process. And we're brilliant at it. We're educated to do it. If you think about any exam you have ever taken in your life, the exam question has provided the information. You've learned to process. You have to apply that process correctly to the data or the information in the question. And on the back of that, hopefully you'll get the right answer, the outcome. And every exam you take is testing your ability to do second stage thinking. If you're good at it, you go on to bigger and better exams. I don't know, who knows, you go to university. Just more sophisticated versions of second stage thinking are then tested. If you then get a good degree, you get a good job. If you're a good problem solver, you'll get promoted. If you're really good at second stage thinking, you'll, be, you'll enter the senior ranks of the organization. We promote and reward second stage thinking. We are brilliant at it. And it is fantastic for generating useful ideas. It's quick, we're good at it, we can always turn up with some useful ideas. And if you're familiar with the brain, kind of the, the kind of the classical split of the brain between left brain and right brain, this second stage thinking is very much a left brain process. Left hand side of the brain, factually, has a very high density of very short, rapid firing neural networks. It is brilliant for processing data. It's like a, a densely wired computer. Uh, and as soon as you present information, boof, it hums into life and lights start going and flickering and it's bang, data's flap it, flashing all over the place. It is really quick because the connections are really short. And so it can process information and bang, it generates outcomes for you. It is phenomenally quick and it's 
fantastic for generating useful ideas. And if all you want in life is useful ideas, continuous improvement, stay with it. Just settle for that. You need to do nothing more because we're innately good at this stuff. But if you want step change, if you want discontinuous improvement, if you want novel ideas, the likes of which you had, you had not come across before, we need to create new neural networks. And that's where the right-hand side of the brain comes in. And the right-hand side of the brain, factually, has a much lesser density of much longer, less connected neural networks. It is brilliant for making new connections, but it is horribly, horribly slow because you're making new connections. So slow, left-hand side of the brain gets bored waiting for it and therefore leaps in with its quick processing and gives you an answer. So useful ideas are delivered really quickly. Novel ideas are really slow. And with time pressures and with impatience around the place, we shut out the right-hand side of the brain to make sure we're focusing on those quick ideas that just come off, that just kind of reeled off, but they're not novel, which is why useful kills novel, because useful is quick and novel is slow. And the consequences are profound, because what it means is we rush in and solve problems before we really understand them. And we do it consistently. We are rubbish at defining problems. We just take the first half-baked definition of a problem statement and rush in and try and solve it within the organization. We've never really understood it. Now, if all you want is useful ideas, that's not a problem. But if you truly want creativity from time to time and step change, you choose the few occasions when you want to focus techniques on making sure you're giving the right-hand side time to breathe. breathe. Let me give you an example. Um, suppose we have a football tournament. Go with me on this. No one gets hurt. Football tournament, simple knockout process. So a whole bunch of teams turn up. Uh, 145 of them. So 145 teams turn up for a straight knockout tournament. Uh, it's brutal. There's uh, no extra. There's extra time if there's a, a draw. There's no replays. At the end of extra time, if it's still a draw, we have penalties. Question is dead simple. We're the organising committee. We need to work out how many games are played through to and including the final. Straight question. So just give it a moment's thought, and I'll take you through the thought process. How would you go about solving that? What's the first thing that comes into your head? Now, most individuals, having done this extensively over the last number of years, most what pops into their head is this kind of knockout chart. Um, so here's our, our standard process that we're going to use for, for analyzing this data. This is straight second stage thinking. Here's our process. How simple is this? We've only got one piece of data. The only piece of data is we've got 145 teams. So all we have to do is put 145 teams into this process, and out will come the answer. Dead straightforward. Now, this involves a halving and halving and halving process. So you put the 145, half, 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 and you can add up the number of games and you're away. And instantly you spot there's a difficulty. For goodness sake, it's an odd number. And I've had people tell me you cannot have a knockout tournament with an odd number of contestants. That's simply not true. Uh, because what you do is put a buy in the system. So all we have to do is put a buy in the system. So what we now do is kind of go back to the and say, right, fine, we'll put a buy. Call it 146. So it's half 146. We're away now. It's an even number, for goodness sake, we can play. A half of uh, 146 is 73. Oh, curse it. We're stuffed again. So we're over in this end again where we're stuffed, where we're caught. Cool. Oh, I know. What we've got is a number of buys. There's more than one buy. So we go all the way back around again. And we put a number up. We've now got to work out how many buys there are. And what we do laboriously is get ourselves locked in a second stage thinking loop. Take the information, process it. Out comes the answer. No, it doesn't. Try again. Think harder. There's the process. Out comes the answer. No, it doesn't. Go back again. And we go around this loop. And eventually, we inevitably bail out. Uh, some of you will have bailed out really quickly. Some of you will never have engaged with the problem, for goodness sake. Maths and football at this time of the morning. Uh, but nevertheless, what we do is we bail out. And when we bail out, and our organizations are riddled with examples like this, where we take a problem, we try and solve it, we've got a process, it doesn't quite work, try harder, it doesn't quite work, try harder, it doesn't quite work, for goodness sake, we've got to do something, bail out. And when we put a bailout in place, we then put an approximation in place. And what we say is, well, it doesn't quite solve the problem, uh, but it gets close, and then we'll put a workaround in the system. And these workarounds are expensive, they take time and they cost money. And they can do both simultaneously. I mean, time is money, I know that, but it can take materials, for goodness sake. We throw things at it. And, and our organizations are riddled with examples like this, riddled with them. And they, they, they kill agility. They cost a fortune in the organization. The larger the organization, the more you'll have. And it's a consequence of second stage thinking not working. You haven't really solved the problem. You've got close, but you've then had to throw resources at the final end of it. And the trick here is to recognize that when second stage thinking isn't working for you, stop trying to solve the problem. Go back to the beginning. First stage thinking is nothing to do with solving the problem, everything to do with understanding it. 
And so the first thing we have to do is to explore the problem. Most organizations, most individuals have no tolerance for this. It's for goodness sake, we know what the problem is, let's fix it. Wrong. You do not know what the problem is. What we have to do is to explore it and see if there's a better understanding of the problem that we can develop. So I want to ask you two questions about this problem that are nothing to do with solving it, everything to do with understanding it, and then we'll see where we go from there. And here's the first of them. Uh, how many, how, if you've got 145 teams in this tournament, how many losers are there in total? It's a deceptively simple question, and people often balk at it, but actually it's quite straightforward. It is horribly simple. You've got 145 teams. You're going to have, um, clearly, you're going to have 144 teams that, that have lost. You have to. Here's my second question. How many losers are there per game? And again, a horribly simple question. Now, we're, we struggle with this because the last process, the second stage thing, it was complicated. We had to work out the number of buys and, and people he hesitate because they think there's a trick. These are two very simple questions. Just to answer the questions at face value. The number of losers per game trivially is one. Now, we are perfectly positioned to now move into second stage thinking. Listen very carefully. If there are 144 losers in the entire tournament, and there's one loser for every game played, how many games are played in the entire tournament? Now again, some people try and halve numbers, they double numbers, this is horribly straightforward. There are 144 losers, there's one loser for every match, there must be 144 matches played. If you have N contestants in any knockout tournament, you always have N minus one losers, and therefore there are always N minus one games played. How simple is this? How cool is it? You've cracked it. Now, many people, people freak out when they go to go, no, 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 that can't be right. That's remarkably simple. And the second stage thinking was so complicated. So it must be harder. In fact, I don't even know how many buys there are in the system as yet. So how can that be right? Notice my question was nothing to do with the number of buys. It was to do with the number of matches that are played, the number of games that are played. So I, I don't care how many buys are played. All I want to know is how many matches are played in the entire tournament. And whatever your number is, if there are a million contestants, a million teams, it would be 999,999 matches. Just like that, I can tell you, because of this N minus one rule. Try it. If you have four teams tip up for a tournament, that's two semifinals and a final. That's three games, four minus one equals six. This has to work. This has to work. And what it demonstrates is the value of exploring a problem, sometimes, before you go on and solve it. If it's a problem you cannot solve, it's a surefire sign that you've probably got your definition of the problem, your understanding of the problem wrong. And we have a whole range of techniques that will help you manage that process. Now, this isn't fair because um, we're talking about second stage thinking and first stage, and I gave you an example that kind of brought it to life. But um, quite legitimately, you can argue this isn't fair because the example I gave you isn't typical of any of your business problems. Uh, this is a puzzle. And the reason we call it a puzzle is because there's a single unique correct answer. And your problems do not have single unique correct answers. In an organizational business context, uh, any problem, if you look at the number of ideas that you can generate and a number of possible solutions, you've got rubbish solutions down at this end of the graph and brilliant solutions at the top end. Um, your situations will have a spectrum of possible solutions, but you'll have loads of rubbish solutions and very, very few brilliant solutions. And because we rush in and solve the problem before we understand it, we will never access the brilliant solutions down here. You can't get there. And we're very, very good, fortunately, at filtering out the majority of rubbish solutions. So what we do is we limit ourselves to a slice in the middle, and it's useful ideas that come out of that process, because in this area here, we have useful ideas. We never get to brilliant, but we do get useful, and we do it quickly. And the quicker you rush in and solve a problem, the more you slide that cursor back to the left, and the more rubbish your solutions become. What we need to do is to prioritize. When you know you need to achieve some breakthrough thinking and you want a fresh approach, take time out to make sure you've explored the problem, to give you the chance of accessing the brilliant, novel and useful solutions that might sit at this top end. And that's the essence. And what we do at the Idea Center is we can help you by introducing you to techniques that will effectively shut off the left-hand side of the brain that will otherwise dominate to give the right-hand side of the brain time to breathe. And that's the first of your blocks. It's hardwired. Now, fortunately, we can make decisions really quickly and fight or flight. We need to, which is why the left brain is so developed. The consequence is we're rubbish at creativity. So what we need to do is to learn how to turn that off. Uh, and we can give you techniques that will systematically drive that process. First of the blocks. Second of the blockages 
is this thing called patterning systems. And I said before that we, uh, we make sense of our worlds by looking backwards, and, and we do. And when we look backwards, what we're doing is looking for patterns that we've experienced in the past uh, that will help us understand the situation today. Um, it's as if we have inside our heads an enormous virtual filing cabinet. And inside that virtual filing cabinet, neatly filed, beautifully indexed, there are files and folders for pat and pat containing patterns for everything we have ever experienced. Everything we've ever made sense of, anything we've ever processed, anything we've ever learned through any of our senses is stored in that filing cabinet. It is ginormous, but it's a virtual filing cabinet. And what we're doing subconsciously, constantly, is fingering through that filing cabinet to see if we can find patterns to help us make sense of everything we're experiencing. And problem solving is no different. Uh, when a problem is explained to you, what you're doing is subconsciously filtering through your filing cabinet to see if you can access a pattern that helps you understand from your past experience the situation we're presented with today. When you've done it, you then apply that pattern to determine your future behavior. Let me give you an example. Um, there are two images here, which are metaphors for problem solving. Um, each one of them is made up of black blobs. So if you look at the image on the left, um, if, as I explain the problem to you, I give you black blobs of information. And as I give you the black blobs, what you're doing, whether you like it or not, subconsciously is filtering through your filing cabinet. We're good at this. It's quick. To see if you can find a pattern that makes sense of that particular set of black blobs. And if you can find it and solve it, you go, cracky, I've done that one. I can see a pattern. Done it. Go, go to the next one. You then move to the image on the right. Same process. The image on the right is slightly more tricky. It's less explained. There's more fresh space in there because there are less detail to help you hang your hat on and find a pattern. So I, I normally reckon about... 20, 25% of people can normally see the image on the left. Um, it's down at less than 10%, maybe one in 20 can see the image on the right. So that's kind of where we're going there. But this is just a metaphor for problem solving using your visual senses. Um, and what we do is you kind of ask the question, well, can you tell us what the image is? And, and some people can and some people can't. I'm going to ask you a simple question. I'm going to say, this image here, for those that can't see it, my question of you is going to be, can you see the image of a man's face? It's kind of partial. It's from shoulders up. It doesn't include the forehead. It kind of cuts off just above the eyes. Um, people can often see a Jesus type figure. Someone bizarrely said years ago, Jesus playing a guitar, which is not expression. But then you go, oh, you know what? Maybe so. Uh, che Guevara is another example. Uh, Cat Stevens, people can often see there. So that's that image. So hopefully that's helped some of you kind of go, oh, you get the aha moment. Now, the aha moment is particularly interesting because we're such innate pattern matches, we have an inbuilt reward mechanism inside us and, and when we do a pattern match our brain says to us oh well done you you've done it and it gives you as a reward gives you a squirt of the hormone dopamine and dopamine is a feel-good hormone that makes you go oh and it makes your eye your pupils dilate your face brightens up you often do a physical jerk and you often utter the words aha and the aha moment is literally that moment when you get a belt of dopamine and it produces an involuntary response oh i can see it that's the aha moment now the image on the right more complicated is my question can anyone see a cowboy on a horse? A cowboy on a horse. Just have a look at it. And some of you, I have no doubt, will be receiving at this moment that modest belt of dopamine. Nice feeling, short-lived. Uh, you'll get over it. Um, for those that can't, let me help you out a little bit. This is the hat of the cowboy on the horse. Uh, here's the body of the cowboy. Here's the horse's head. Here's the horse's tail. There's the legs. Hopefully that helps some of you. You can see the cowboy on the horse. All of a sudden, it hoves into view. Many of you, you didn't know you had a filing cabinet, let alone a folder entitled Cowboy on a Horse. When you look in it, you kind of go, ah, I didn't, couldn't see it until you said it. Now you've said it, I can see it. Pattern matching in action. Uh, for those that are struggling, here is the conventional, what we're doing is sifting through this filing cabinet. Uh, but here's the conventional interpretation of those two images. So let's have a look at those two images. And what I'll do is I'll flick to the next one. There you go. So hopefully that's helped. So you've got the Cowboy on the Horse and the Man's Head. Oh, you know, all of a sudden you can see it. Interesting. Now, once we've got the pattern match, we've done the pattern match, we can now decide what to do in order to solve the problem. This is brilliant for problem solving. But recognize, let's take the cowboy on the horse. What we're doing is using a pattern from our past to superimpose on today's situation, the like of which will then determine what our future behavior is. The world around us is changing so quickly, you have to assume that the information that's in that filing cabinet is becoming increasingly out of date at an increasing rate of knots. So we're using old, outdated patterns of the past to determine today how we're going to behave in the future. We're limited. We're limited by our past experiences. We're shutting our eyes off to opportunities moving forward. And what we need to do is to learn how to handle this. We need to learn how to break free. Notice this information is incomplete. There are huge gaps because I don't know all the information associated with the problem. 
But what we do when we see a cowboy on a horse is the brain fills in the gaps. So you can see it as plain as day. Notice some of the information doesn't fit. The information here, the information here doesn't fit. Not a problem to the brain. What it does, it gets rid of it. It airbrushes it out. Stuff that conflicts with the cowboy on the horse, it gets rid of. It's inconvenient. That's what we're doing in our businesses day in, day out. Notice the hat. The hat often people will say, no, no, this hat's too big. It's clearly a Mexican, for goodness sake. Um, and someone else will say, yeah, it's definitely a Mexican, because look, it's a piebald horse. It's black and white horse. So now we know, just from a pattern match, a simple pattern match on scanned data, we know the breeding line of the horse, the nationality, the career choice, and the sex of the rider. That's how confident we are that we understand this problem, because we're pattern matchers. And if we're using the wrong pattern, we will be confident about the pattern match, and we will then make inappropriate suboptimal decisions. And we're doing it day in, day out. Most of the time, it doesn't matter, because all we need is useful ideas. But when you need the best ideas, you need to understand this patterning stuff. Now, we are innately pattern matches. Let me see if I can blacken the screen. Just bear with me on this. What I want to do, no, I can't. Uh, I'm going to go to the, bear with, I'm just going to take you away from these slides. Right, let's go back to patterning systems. Uh, what I want you to do is um, just consider your first day in any organization. When you arrive and you tip up on day one in any organization, um, it's always a mess because I don't care how senior you are, it's disorienting. And the reason it's disorienting is you have no pattern. Um, I've, I, you meet people you've never met before, you've got no pattern, you don't know how they're going to behave, you don't know where the toilets are, you don't know where lunch is going to come, don't talk to me about clients and suppliers, for goodness sake. I've got no idea about any of this stuff. I was chief exec, you turn up on day one, it is, it is disorienting and uncomfortable. And the reason it's uncomfortable is you don't have a pattern for how the organization operates. But over time, at the end of the first week, you've got the basics. By the end of how long? Four, five, six months, you become comfortable. The reason you're comfortable is because you have a pattern for how we do things around here. And don't be surprised that the pattern you have in your head is identical to the pattern that everyone else has in their heads. Because they have, helped, they have shared their pattern and helped you form your pattern. You all end up with the same pattern in the same organization. The cowboy on the horse is effectively a metaphor for how we do things around here. And it gets lodged in it. And we're so wedded to it. We're so wedded to it that when, we, when we've got it, we can't unget it. We can't, un we can't let loose of it. So me saying to you, look, can you give me a, a solution to this problem? You will instantly, your world of what is, the cowboy on the horse, will govern your, your, your useful idea that you generated. You'll generate a useful idea based on the cowboy on the horse interpretation pattern for the organization. If I say, no, 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 I want novelty. I want you to think differently. It's like me saying to you, don't see the cowboy on the horse. Don't see the cowboy on the horse. And then tell me what you can find. Try it. I want to put the slide back up again. I want you to just close your eyes for a tick once I scan forward and put this slide up. And when I say open your eyes, I want you to not, I want you to recreate five minutes ago. You've only been exposed to this cowboy on a horse for what, three minutes. Um, you've been in your organizations a lot longer. The patterning's more embedded. This ought to be easy. Five minutes ago, the majority of you could not see the cowboy on the horse. So when I say open your eyes, I want you to try not to see a cowboy on a horse. Replicate the experience from the past. Go, open your eyes. Don't see the cowboy on the horse. You're stuffed. Because once you've got the pattern, can't let go of it. And therein lies your difficulty. Just telling people to think differently, waste of time. What we have to do is provide structures that will scramble their thinking. And these are the creative techniques that will allow you to play and see things differently. And what do these techniques do effectively is make the familiar, cowboy on the horse, unfamiliar. And that's how these techniques work. And they're strange and unusual. And they're difficult. Uh, if they were easy, everyone would be doing them. They're not. So the trick is to learn how to master them. Got one more of these. Just have a quick glance at this one. Um, no shouting out is what I would normally say. Feel free to shout out. I won't hear. But um, let's go with this. I'm going to put another slide up. Uh, I like the same thing. Let's have a look at the pattern. See if you can see what it is. I promise you, you know what this next image is. Have a look at it. I promise you know what it is. Let's have a look, see if you can see what it is. Very familiar to you. I promise you, you know what this is an image of. Now, for those that can see it, brilliant. There'll be few of you. For those that can't see it, you're being really creative because uh, I'm going to ruin your creativity at a stroke. Can anyone see a cowboy on a horse upside down? All I've done is I've taken that image and I've rotated it to 180 degrees. We don't have a pattern in our head for a cowboy on a horse upside down. All of a sudden, you're liberated. You look at the information differently. And metaphorically, that's how these creative problem solving techniques work. So kind of go with me on this. It's kind of a strange and unusual disorienting effect. If you don't like it, not a problem. Stay with useful ideas and condemn yourself to a life of continuous improvement. 
But if you want to break free, you have to become comfortable with the techniques that will scramble your thinking, disorient you, liberate you, generate fresh novel ideas, bang, drive them into the organization, you're away. Now, children are phenomenally good at this stuff because they have stunning imagination. Uh, they have no difficulty with that novel and useless. They can suspend judgment because, quite frankly, they don't have the judgment. Think about it. When you're born, when you come into this world, you have an empty filing cabinet. Um, you're literally empty. But from the second you're born, you start putting stuff in the filing cabinet. And by the time you reach adulthood, you've got a full filing cabinet. And still, we pile more stuff in there. But we as adults are brilliant at useful because we've got a full filing cabinet of patterns. We are rubbish at novel because we have, an, we have a full filing cabinet of patterns. Children are brilliant at novel because they've got an empty filing cabinet, but they're rubbish at useful because they've got an empty filing cabinet. And children think fundamentally differently. There was some interesting research done, this thing called the Torrance Test for Creativity, and what it shows is this. Uh, at the age of four, more than 98% of children are deemed as being genius level at creativity. Not good, genius level at creativity. It's astounding. At the age of 10, that falls to 34%. This is the learning process. This is education and parenting piling stuff into the filing cabinet. And what we're just doing is destroying their creativity. Well, we've all done it. But if you've got children, you end up saying, oh, for goodness sake, stop playing around. Grow up. You're not a child anymore. What we're doing is saying, we've given you patterns. For goodness sake, use them. By the age of 17, it drops down to 11%. And, and what you're seeing is education and growing up, the filling of the filing cabinet. At best, we recruit these for creativity. When what we should be doing is recruiting these four-year-olds and their thinking. Or we should be taking these and teaching them how to think like these. That's how this creativity works. What we do is take adults and we give them mechanisms to simulate childlike, not childish, childlike thinking, which will liberate the thought processes. Uh, and let me give you some of these. They work like this. It's a whole host of these techniques, and this is kind of a small cross-section. Uh, there's a vast array of them. They're all designed to introduce play into the problem-solving technique. They disorient and they throw people off balance to allow them to liberate them to see things differently. Uh, Lego, bottom right-hand corner, is a phenomenal tool uh, for creative problem solving. It's often used for continuous improvement, actually, but you can become accredited by Lego as a creative problem solving practitioner. You have a certificate on the wall, CPD points in the bank, it's just, what's not to like, for goodness sake. If you go to the website, seriousplay.com, you'll find it's a website that's owned by Lego. Uh, and what they do is they sell Lego kits to business for creative problem solving. Now, whatever your problem is, what you do, first stage, is take to the Lego, make a model of your problem out of Lego, which is a weird experience. And you can, it feels weird because you're a grown-up messing with Lego in a business environment. And how on earth do you create a model of a very abstract concept in your head? That's the issue. What you'll discover within minutes is you forget the Lego, you start building and assembling the bits, and you start producing a three-dimensional representation of a very complex, abstract model in your head. Lego is a brilliant tool for articulating what you mean about a problem. All of a sudden, anyone can look at your model and go, oh, I understand what you're doing. Let's have an explore. Let's refine it and tweak it. It's brilliant. What you then do is solve the problem in Legoland. You've got a Lego model of the problem. Imagine a six-year-old tips up and you say, well, that's my problem. I want it to be different. How do I do that? Whatever you do to modify the Lego model is simply a metaphor for what you need to do in real life. It is a phenomenally powerful technique. It takes about 20 minutes. Uh, we got to a position where we'd use it extensively across each of the organizations I've ever been associated with. Really powerful tool. So have a look at it. I've also got, I'm not going to go over all these by any stretch, but just give you a flavor. And what we do at the Idea Center is we teach people how to use these techniques. Um, I've got brainstorming in there, which is curious because actually brainstorming is seldom a creative technique. Remember, we define creativity as generating ideas that are novel and useful. Uh, what we do in a brainstorming session typically is get a room full of experts. Um, recognize the experts are the guardians of the pattern of the way we do things around here. And mysteriously, we expect that by locking them in a room that they should come up with some fresh novel thinking. Why would they do that? Because they have such a deeply ingrained pattern. What tends to happen is you get a brainstorming session that just lists as many useful ideas as we can think of. Not novel, because novel's weird. If anyone brainstorms a novel idea, and if it's novel and useless, you are clearly bonkers and shouldn't be in the room. So what we do is get a nice respectable list of useful ideas, all consistent with the cowboy and the horse, which then allows us to select the best of those ideas. It's a brilliant continuous improvement tool. It is not creative. My antidote to uh, brainstorming is a technique called superheroes. And in superheroes, 
what I've got is a series of cards, and on each card is defined a different superhero. So we've got Wonder Woman, Batman, Spider Man, Captain Fantastic, Doctor. We've got a whole row. We've got the full row Spider Man. They're all in there, for goodness sake. Um, and what we do is hand the cards out so that every member of the, the team then has a card. They internalize the card they've got. They need to become that superhero. Because what I want them then to do is to brainstorm solutions to whatever the business problem is in the style of their superhero. So only using their superhero skills. What it guarantees is that you end up with a range of solutions that are both novel and useless. First stage of creativity. Guarantees it. None of the ideas are going to be, uh, going to be conventional because you're using superhero skills. Will they be useful? Of course they won't. You're using superhero skills. First stage of creativity. What we then do is take the most outrageous of those ideas, understand how it works, what are the characteristics and attributes, and then look for a useful way of delivering the same effect. Bingo, you've now got a creative solution. Hugely powerful technique, but needs skill facilitation. What we do is we help organizations embed those skills in for themselves. We, we can do it for you, but our preference is to teach you to do it for yourselves. And we can show you how all this stuff works. Really, there are organizations across the UK now that are using superheroes as a technique. And many have found that, that it's really, really effective. There is a, an Alcatel company in, uh, in the Cambridge area that uses these techniques. And you walk in their meeting room, and in the corner of their meeting room, they've got a running rail. And on the running rail, they have the outfits of the superheroes. Because what they've discovered is having the card is one thing. But if you've actually dressed yourself up as the superhero, my word, you generate novel and useless ideas because you're well into the swing of it. What you then do is take the most outrageous of the contributions and convert it into something creative. Bingo. Every time. Guarantee you. None of these techniques takes longer than an hour. None of these techniques involves more than six people in a room at a time. None of the fancy messing around with, with small children, childish sh chairs and pastel shades. This is serious stuff. You can believe it looking at this image. Based within the business. Transforms the way organizations operate. And what we do at the Ideas Center is we help you with these techniques. We can introduce the blockages, make sure people understand it. We can give you the skills to drive and facilitate a whole raft of creative problem solving techniques of which this is kind of a, a cross section, if you like. There are more beyond this. Uh, we can come in and do it for you, or we can show you how to do it for yourselves. And that's kind of the key element. Um, key take home for me, simple definition of creativity is the generation of ideas that are both novel and useful. Everything flows from there. Doing creativity and generating creative ideas is a waste of time unless you then make them work in the organization. That's the innovation process. And that demands a leadership and a, and a foot behind it. It's kind of iron fist, velvet glove. Push the change through. You are changing the model of the organization. And again, we've got a whole bunch of models and training we can put in place to help you with that. You choose where you want it. You apply the techniques. You generate the ideas. You implement the ideas. What's not to like? You've now got control of the innovation process. Um, and finally, um, there's a whole bunch of materials on the website. Uh, we have an app, the Idea Center app. If you download the app, you've got access to a whole bunch of videos in there, which explains all this stuff, gives you case studies of each of the techniques. There's actually a subscription model um, that, that allows you to subscribe to get a breakdown. We've done how-to videos that break down all the techniques into tiny components to help facilitate us, and you can talk to us about that moving forward. Uh, and if anyone's got any queries on any of this stuff, if any of you like to dig back and rake over, some of the stuff is on the website and in the app. Feel for absolutely free to get in contact with me and I'll help you as best I can. We can talk through it. We do a lot of this stuff remotely. Obviously, it works better face to face. And I travel the length and breadth of the country. We can make sure we have time to get together. Um, that's it. It's been an absolute pleasure looking at the time, kind of just on uh, the hour. Um, so hopefully we've contained it all. Hopefully it's been interesting, stimulating, slightly challenging around the edges. The overwhelming wrapper that goes around this is this stuff works. It's different. If it's not easy, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. But if you get the skills in place and get your heads around the blockages, then you can start to make giant strides forwards in the organization. And I know that's true because I've done it. So please do get in contact if you want any more. It's been an absolute pleasure. Any questions you put in during the webinar, we'll pick those up and respond to them directly and share the responses. So hopefully that's okay. So I won't take any more of your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And as I say, I hope to be in contact with you shortly. All righty. Cheerio. Bye.